season. So uh, the absolute leader, well, he's got 40% of the Republican Party in the best poll he's ever had. So he's got 40% of 25%. That means 10%. So he's got about 10% of the total vote, Republican, Democrat, the maybe the likely voters or the registered voters, something like that. Um, is he really the absolute leader? Let's go to real clear politics. They always have this average of the of the most recent polls, right? So they have an average of the last five general election polls, matchups, right? Pitting Trump against Hillary Clinton. Result, Hillary Clinton is ahead by 5.8%. So how is Trump the absolute leader? He's not. Vladimir Vladimirovich, you have been misinformed. You should kick out whoever told you that. Was it somebody from RT? My God, they don't know what they're doing. Then we have in Iowa. Okay, Iowa, right? The first ski uh, poll, uh, caucus state uh, at the end of uh, beginning of February. Trump is running behind that other fascist demagogue, Ted Cruz, by 1%. So how can he be the absolute leader if he's not in first place? Um, and we can continue uh, down the line, right? He, uh, you know, we can look at Trump's negatives, which are sky high, right? Um, I think Hillary, Hillary and Trump are about at the same level. Now, uh, it used to be that we had Georgi Arbatov, right? Academician Georgi Arbatov, very interesting person. I met him. Arbatov uh, was the head of the U.S. Canada Institute. So he was academician Arbatov, the head of the U.S. Canada Institute of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, now the Russian Academy of Sciences. And his job, one of his biggest jobs, biggest challenge of his, of his, his job description was that he was supposed to predict who would win the next U.S. presidential election. And I'll, I'll have to come up with the specifics, but he was wrong several times in the 70s into the 80s. He was wrong, and it was embarrassingly wrong. And the whole Politburo and the, uh, you know, the leaders, the top uh, nomenclatura of the Soviet Union were very, very um, unhappy with Arbatov because he couldn't predict what was going to go on. Um, I think there is a systematic problem. The other thing that occurs to me is back when Moscow had a political party in the United States, right, the Communist Party USA, when they had such a party, which was supposed to maneuver to try to help them, you take a look at the people they put in charge of it, right? Jay Lovestone, oh my God, became became one of the biggest um, Russophobic spooks in the entire OSS CIA stable at various times. Uh, we've also got somebody like William Z. Foster. We got Earl Browder. We've got Gus Hall. These people are all disastrous. They were not leaders. They were. They just couldn't do it. So the track record of Russian judgments about the United States and about the uh, actual interventions is simply a history of disasters. And I would point out, Putin deals with right-wingers much of the time, right? Because the Second International, Socialist International, is controlled by Soros and the CIA. And this means that they're Russophobic, they're anti-Russian. But it does not follow from that that you can then turn over to right-wing reactionaries and think you're going to get anywhere. Silvio Berlusconi was an exception. Because this was firmly based on economic cooperation, pipelines, oil, uh, commercial considerations, going back decades, right? Going back to Vittorio Valletta at Fiat, who put the uh, the first uh, Fiat. They, they were building the uh, the Lada, right? The Fiat 124 in Russia back in the uh, in, in around 1970. But when you get to somebody like Marine Le Pen. Oh, my God. Uh, she is a scoundrel. This is horrendous. Her father was from Vichy, a Vichy fascist. And look at her. And look how she fails. Last Sunday, right, we were told that two Sundays ago we had the first round of these French regional elections, and it looked like Marine Le Pen was going to clean up 
She was going to take about half of France in terms of rather important regional governments who have very important functions, a little bit like a U.S. state, maybe not quite, but similar. And um, she was supposed to win last Sunday. Well, guess what? People were so horrified and disgusted that a scoundrel, a racist, bigoted, xenophobic witch would take over so much power that everybody came out and defeated her in the second round. How about that? How embarrassing, really, for, for the Russian apparatus, or maybe not so much for Putin personally, although maybe so. We have to go and look what he said about it. Uh, this is no good. Uh, or... What can we take? We can take other um, cases, but that's pretty much good enough. If we put together Trump and Marine Le Pen and, oh, that guy Orban in Hungary, right? He, he may have some reasons to do what he's doing, but this also not good, not good. You don't want to be seen in public speaking. It's embarrassing. And we'll get back to this very important question in just a minute on both Crisis Radio. But uh, we are here to sincerely lament and deplore the fact that our friend uh, Vladimir Putin has chosen to uh, make this very imprudent and ill-considered statement, which is simply factually wrong, and it's embarrassingly wrong. Trump is not the absolute leader of anything. He is the absolute leader of zero. This is all a an illusion, and um, I'm afraid it, it it reflects the specific difficulty in regard to the United States, where Arbatov and company seldom got it right. Let's put it that way. But also, you know, if we're going to look at relevant history, we have to go back to the Soviet Union because that's what Russia was for uh, low those uh, many decades. So we have to look at that, too. Now, if you look at Germany, the main thing you see there is that the, there was a communist party in Germany, the KPD, which was the pro-Russian party. OK, so that's what's relevant. And the KPD carried out these things uh, that they were getting from Moscow, in particular from Grigory Zinoviev, who was the head of the Communist International, right? a group of political parties worldwide. KPD was a mass party. And the French Communist Party was uh, just about a mass party, right? So that those were the big assets that they had. Now, what the Russians typically did wrong was that they projected their domestic policy outward. You can see why, right? Big country, huge country, and uh, there's so much going on inside it that it sometimes looked like you can treat the rest of the world in the same way. So this is called the third period, right? 1928 to 1935 is known as the third period in terms of the history of the Communist International. And in 1928, all the Congresses, the Union, you know, Communist Union people and the KPD and all the other parties decided that capitalism was about to collapse of its own weight. And it was the 19, you know, 1929 crash. There was that. But that didn't change the politics. It didn't make the third period correct the third period said the main problem we have in the world is social fascism the nazis are not that bad nazis are not the, the main enemy the italian fascists are not the same enemy the main enemy is the social democrats socialists and their trade unionists so we've got to attack them as social fascists and instead of making united front proposals to expose them and educate the workers and the other people in the social democracy. The uh, Zinoviev Moscow line was to say, uh, no, we're not going to do that. We're simply going to split. We're going to tell our people to leave the social democracy, socialist parties and the unions that they control. And that was simply a disaster. Right? It meant that every communist party became a very unsavory group of uh, rather desperate uh, unemployed people. And with that, as commentators have said, uh, unemployed people, you can certainly, you can do a lot of good street demonstrations, but you cannot contend for power. And power is what you need to be aiming at, right? Not the bigger and better uh, mass demonstrations. So um, it was obvious that the only way you could stop Hitler was by having a united front 
of the communists, the social democrats, and all their unions, and some other groups that would have come in on that, and try to stop Hitler from seizing power. No. On the eve of Hitler's seizure of power, the head of the KPD, right, Aaron Selman, according to one account, which I think is probably accurate, says to his friend, um, the friend asks him, what are you going to do tonight? Hitler is going to be named chancellor tomorrow. He says, I'm going to go bowling because I don't think that's a big deal. And he goes on to say, we've been under fascism for the last three chancellors, under Brüning, under von Papen, under Schleicher. So for, what, two and a half years, we've already been under uh, fascism. So why should I get out of shape because of this guy, Hitler? He'll soon be swept aside like all the others have been, said the head of the KPD, uh, Telman, right? And it's Telman. So he's getting that from Zinoviev. So it means that Zinoviev either doesn't have a clue or he actually thinks uh, Hitler might, uh, might be uh, beneficial. There is this famous quote where Stalin allegedly says, Hitler is the icebreaker of the revolution. And when Hitler busts everything up, after that is when we can create um, Soviet power, essentially, in Germany. And it, to some extent, it happened, right? It was called the German Democratic Republic uh, of the 1940s to, uh, to, you know, to the late uh, 1980s. So that's a little bit of the problem, that they got it all wrong. And that's the nicest thing we can say, that they got it all wrong concerning Germany. Now, how about France? They also had a mass party, right, PCF. Uh, and the problem there was the PCF, uh, well, there's an interval, right? After, after 1935, after losing Germany, which was pretty much the ball game, but it could still go on, after 1935, <clears throat> the common turn says, oh, we were wrong. We've, we've got to go to the opposite. In other words, not uh, sectarianism and the third period and the social fascist theory and splitting everything. We've got to go to the uh, togetherness party. So we're going to get parties that represent bankers, industrialists, but also small business people, petty bourgeoisie middle class people, stuff like this in the European class system. Uh, and we'll have a popular front against fascism, popular front to defend the country. Now, that's not so great either, but that's a whole lot better than the third period. A lot of this was imposed by Germans who had been through the mill of seeing Hitler take power with the Communist Party doing nothing to, uh, to prevent it. So um, these... Uh, Popular frontists, they won a big election in France, 1936, June 1936, socialists, communists take over the government. This is the Léon Blum, Blum, B-L-U-M government. And um, all, they, then there's a mass strike, right? The factories get occupied, all sorts of stuff going on. So they, this thing had a chance for a while. But the problem then was, in, in terms of picking alliances badly, well, there's this Hitler-Stalin pact, right? There's the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of uh, August 1939. That's probably the supreme example of picking the wrong uh, alliances. Uh, although there are extenuating circumstances, but we can't go into this now. Uh, at that point, the, the situation of the French Communist Party had been, French Communist Party was attacking Hitler. They said, Hitler is the main enemy. Hitler, Hitler, Hitler. Correct. But then after the Hitler-Stalin Pact, Moscow tries to get the French communists to say, well, no, don't do it that way. Do it that both imperialist parties are bad and just leave it at that. The British French are bad. Hitler is bad. So we don't want to, you know, we don't want to be involved with either one. Hitler-Stalin pact, of course, set off World War One, uh, World War Two. World War Two started just several days after the Hitler-Stalin pact. And here's the trick. The French Communist Party realizing that they were in big danger. They were so identified with the Soviet Union and that Stalin was always right and others were always right over there. They, uh, they, they had to uh, essentially make a choice. You're going to go with the Moscow line or your previous line. They said, we're going to stay on the anti-Hitler line because that's the French patriotic line, right? Defend France against Hitler. Good. But the problem then was... Since the French communists were so heavily identified with, with um, uh, the Soviets, the fact that the Soviets from 
Ni August 1939 to June 1941. Soviets were in practically in an alliance with Hitler. They were supplying him with everything he needed.